stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief storymaker of Elkins Consulting. Many of my clients reach out to me because they're in transition. Their children are hitting milestone ages. They want more from their work. They're hitting a big number birthday, and they want to develop clarity about their natural strengths, what their next adventure might look like. In this series, you'll hear me ask my guests questions to dig deeply into the stories that shaped their lives, stories that uncover patterns and may unveil insights into dissatisfaction and also where their strengths lie and where they found and continue to find joy. This podcast's intention is to have listeners think of their own related stories and how they tell them, discovering the internal messages that are limiting their success and discovering how to shift their stories so they become positive life lessons to move them forward. If you're curious about what it would be like to work with me, visit elkinsconsulting.com and schedule a one-time 90-minute StrengthsFinder session. I'm so pleased today to be hosting Hillary Johns, an attorney out of uh, Beverly Hills, California, although she has offices in the Bay Area and also opening one in Manhattan here pretty soon. But we were introduced by a Jeff Furman, who I interviewed on my podcast a few weeks ago and provided some fabulous stories. And right afterward, he was so enamored with the the structure of the podcast, the idea behind the podcast, that he started making all of these wonderful introductions. And Hillary was one of those wonderful introductions. So Hillary, thank you so much for joining me on your stories. Don't define you how you tell them will. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. You know, Jeff is a, a good friend and a great guy. He is a great guy. I love that guy. As is his dog, Mavis. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, he has shared pictures with me of Mavis. And I think she's about the only thing that makes him smile out loud. <laughs> yeah, he is. She's, she's gone and walks together with her. She's great. So she's, oh, she's adorable. So, um I always start these recordings by asking my guests to share something about themselves that most people wouldn't know about them, something you wouldn't see in your bio or your LinkedIn profile. And I do this because I love for our listeners to get to know the the guest uh, before we start diving deeply into their stories, just to know something about them that, that most people otherwise wouldn't know. So what do you think? Do you have something to share? I do. I'm I was thinking about that. I'm happy. I, I like, I'm kind of a nature girl at heart. So I'm happiest when I'm in the middle of the woods or by a river or something like that. Just, you know, places most people would probably feel uncomfortable going. I mean, it's dangerous, but I'm, I'm very happy being out and foraging for myself, things like that. And I'd be very, I'd be one of those people you'd see living off the grid. Probably it wouldn't bother me at all. Wow. Um, that does surprise me, given your work and all of the locations of your law offices. And, and I, I can really relate to that because I love cities. I, I love to I loved living in Washington, D.C. I loved staying for weeks at a time in Paris. Um, but my happy place is definitely in nature, particularly in, on the mountains and on rivers and creeks and exploring. So. Tell me, you said foraging. Oh, <laughs> Describe foraging. that for me. <laughs> well, I just meant if I had to live out, I, you know, I take survivalist classes. I don't mean like militia type things, but you know. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you were out in the middle of the woods and you had to fend for yourself, you know, could you do basket weaving? Could you do, you know, would you know which plants to eat? Would you be able to fish for yourself? So, you know, that, that wouldn't bother me to set up camp in the middle of summer. just have to do that. I'd, be, I'd probably kind of like it. That would be I wouldn't mind it Not that I'm not very fond of LA or Beverly Hills and Manhattan. <laughs> well, you'd have to have some fondness for them, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But it's, yeah, I, I like stuff like that. I do. That's awesome. So tell me about um, how you discovered that because you grew up in Southern California and that's not well known for the camping and outdoorsy activities. Well, they did, but my one, uh, my parents used to take me up in the mountains. You know, they have Julian. They have the, you know, the, all the mountains through Southern California. There are mountain ranges and places you can go. It's just not as well known because most people think of beaches. And then uh, my mother's from the, my mother's from Iowa. So, you know, I was always out and, and now lives in the Midwest, in the Northwest. So there's always trees and mountains and things like that around where you can go. And so uh, we had, I didn't really like the family camping trips, but I liked the, uh, you're going out and learning to fish. And my grandfather used to fly me into Canada to go fishing with him. And, you know, you'd be out in the wilderness. And it was fun. I liked it. 
Ah, that's great. So um, when you think about, I, I'm trying to put this whole idea together of being outdoorsy, of finding your happy place in the woods and the, the somewhat seemingly contradictory lifestyle that you have um, well, being an attorney in a city. Being a well, I mean, I, I think there, I mean, I like the, those are my breaks when I go to places like that. I do a lot of work with animals and I do a lot of public, I do a lot of pro bono work, but I, I think I consider our country as sort of a whole anyways. So I kind of look at things as terrain as a whole. And particularly when you're a bi-coastal lawyer where you're working, I, I kind of look at things maybe a little differently. I don't just look at it as, okay, I have to do this one case. I'm kind of looking like, well, I'm contributing to this area. You know, I mean, anytime you have a, a civilized society, laws are what make things work. I mean, they're the reason we're all not about killing each other. You know, unfortunately, it does happen. So I, I kind of think of it as a whole, like, I, I think it, I always consider it like an honor and privilege to be a lawyer. And, you know, I'm, I'm also licensed in Montana. We do work there. And it's, uh, you know, I, th I sort of consider it just different areas, different parts of the same whole when I look at it like that. But I, I think a lot of people have things when they work a lot, particularly in cities where there's hustle and bustle. I mean, certainly L.A. and New York are the main ones you would think of in the U.S. I think. You know, I think everybody needs places where they, you know, some people, if it's just going to watch their movie or some people like to go to the beach, or I think everybody has places they like to go and they're very, you know, very happy looking at it. And I've actually met a lot of professionals who would say, you know, I would, you know, they're like, oh, if I wasn't doing, you know, I really love doing this and it has nothing to do. It's so seemingly so unrelated to what they're doing. You know, it's like you, you meet a Fortune 500 executive and he, likes woodshop, you know, and he likes to do this, or maybe he, I have a good friend of mine. who's a really highly regarded media attorney and he likes to garden. Mm -hmm. He likes to tend to the, he really, really enjoys just doing. So you, sometimes you, or you find people like they, they like to draw or they, you know, or they have something like that, or they're drawing very idyllic scenes when they're, when they're, they're out you know, taking apart companies or whatever they're doing. So I, I think you see a lot of people with really, Oh, I wouldn't have thought you did. I have a good friend of mine, actually, who's a retired criminal courts attorney, and she likes bead making. And she fosters, uh, I mean, and she would put people, you know, literally in jail for life, you know, and she does like speed making, you know, making jewelry out of beads. And uh, she likes, uh, she fosters uh, older cats, older animals, you know, mm. have health issues. So it's, I think sometimes you see a lot of people like that. You're like, that's a, I, I guess I've seen that, not just with me, but like common, like, Oh wow! I wouldn't have thought such and such like to do that. You know, so I, right. I don't think it's as unusual. I mean, I don't think people tell. I don't think people ask the question that you're asking. Yeah, I think a lot of people also they don't know this about themselves necessarily. They don't know they need those outlets, and they don't necessarily explore them until they have to explore them because they are so burned out, or they're having mental health or physical health issues, and then suddenly they realize. They have to have something outside of their normal routine, outside of their what they consider to be their normal interests in order to take that break. So um, I actually, I, when I'm working with coaching clients, executives like you, one of the first things I ask is, what are you doing creatively? What, what are you doing that you get to step out and do something that feels creative, that feels outside of your normal routine? Let's talk about that. Because for the same exact reason, you need something that separates you from what you, how you see yourself so that you can continue to grow. That's my feeling about it. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I don't think it's just for health reasons. Sometimes people just go and try something or they go to a class or something they find they really enjoy. But that, that's kind of, I think in some ways it's kind of the classic, you know, you find this person who's like, oh, wow, you're really into that now. Or you find out this person's like really loves to be a musician at night you know, or, you know, something like that, or, you know, but I agree. Some people have, it's, it's, I think some people find that sooner than others. I think you know, they sort of, I've always kind of been around, so I've always kind of liked that stuff. And, you know, I'm sure they're, you know, tradition is like, oh, that's weird. That's kind of loud. Now I think it's more accepted that people like to do that kind of stuff. And they're like, oh, such and such is out doing this or whatever they're right. doing. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's important to have, 
outlets that aren't just related to work because that that that's going to lead to you know often unfortunately disastrous or catastrophic results or you know you see people's lives are cut short and things like that i think i think it's a must you, you have to you really do so speaking of um that break and that disastrous transformation or transition or what could be if you don't make that transition mm -hmm. um you mentioned that you shifted gears pretty dramatically 20 years ago when you were a professional athlete and working toward partnership at a law firm. So now, like, uh, my brain is just running in this direction, understanding that you made that decision um, to shift gears before it got to a point where it was a disaster. So what was, what was that? You were a professional athlete. What were you doing? I was a soccer player for a while, and then I just uh, kept going and doing that. And a friend of mine who retired from the national team invited me to come play with them. And said I would, and I enjoyed it. It was fun. It was it wasn't what I was thinking of. Doing. I'm, I'm I'm very grateful that I know about fitness and I you know how to do that and I'm able to stay fit. I think um, I wouldn't want to do it now. You know, I, I, it was not something that I ever saw myself doing you know, in my forties and things like that. And I always wanted to be a traveler. So it kind of, you know, it was hard when you were doing both for a while. And then I played again and they were like, Hey, come join this. And I was like, ah, uh, yeah, I got it. I have something else I, I need to do. At the time I was in my late thirties at that point, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm a lawyer. I got stuff to do. It's not that I did think it's great. And I like seeing men and women, you know, involved in that sport. Um, I think, I, you know, the person I worked with was great. He was super. He's still a good friend of mine today. He's like a father to me. I, but I think I just, it, I was not happy and I knew I was not happy. And I'm kind of one of those people, you know, obviously there are things as a lawyer, a business person, you're like, yeah, I don't like this, but I love what I do. And I, and I don't, I was not happy. And the track I was on, I could just tell was not good. And I, I don't like being not liking stuff. You know, I just don't, I don't think anybody does, but I won't put up with it for long. So I, I made a very drastic change. I left the country. I learned how to speak other languages. I was doing a lot of international work, which we are now in New York. And I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, I mean, I spoke languages and things like that, but I just like, well, these are things, these would all work. These are related. Okay. It'll we'll work together. And then I got back to the U S and took a, not a flexible, but just, you know, most law, a lot of law is very traditional. And, you know, so you sort of had to just look for ways that worked. And I just had to make decisions along the way that I was going to keep very active, even though most people don't. And I was going to, uh, working remotely, I started doing that a while ago and I found I was much more productive. I was much happier and I wasn't looking, you know, it was, yeah, I was going, okay, it's six o'clock yet. Can I go home? I wasn't thinking about that. So I think I do a better service for myself and for the clients because the clients are like, oh, you're the kind of lawyer I want. You're available late at night or early in the morning. I'm like, yeah, because I take naps and I'm going to work out so I can take breaks. And, and I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have, I have hundreds of suits because I'm a trial lawyer, but I don't have to wear a suit every day. I'm not, you know, I'm not going, oh God, here's the morning. I'm not doing the morning commute anymore. And I, I like that, but, and, you know, it's, it was, some of these things were not really commonly accepted yet. So I liked doing that, but I was, I was very glad that I made the break. I mean, I, 20 years from now, I'm kind of, you know, work, doing work with these firms that I wanted to do it, but I also, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult to make your own path if there aren't any. So you kind of have to go, okay, particularly for women, um, you know, the Me Too movement has not just helped people in Hollywood, it helped, it's helped women in other areas of work because there are no legal consequences for conduct that was, that, that should be illegal, but wasn't, uh, and I you was thinking about, you know, 20 years ago, there were still these issues that you had to deal with. I mean, you could do it, but if there was, you know, you had to probably take more crap than I would be willing to do. Uh, you know, uh, men and women and people of color and people of different uh, gender identities, sexual orientation, a, a lot of people had didn't have really any other options. You know, they're, they're very traditional, again, a lot of my friends are Caucasian, men, but there was a very clear path and it was not here. It was literally, you'd be told it's not for everyone. The unfortunate part is I don't think a lot of, a lot of people didn't stick with it for very good reasons. They didn't want to go through this. And there was a lot of talent, I think, that was lost. Uh, just 
throughout every industry because of some of the things that went on. And I think a lot, whether they want to, admit or not, I think a lot of people really lost. I think they are now because there's more diversity and inclusion. There are so many smart, vibrant, talented, hardworking people who really make real contributions. And I think our society, I mean, again, I think the U.S. is better than anybody in the world about doing this as a, on, as a whole. Uh, but there are just a lot of people who are not able to get involved even though they wanted to. I mean, you don't see too many boutique law firms on both by coastal on both points of the both coast that are headed by a woman. You just don't. And it's, um, and you know, there's a lot of changes that have come with it. And I've kind of always been of that temperament, anyways, but particularly with sports and things like that, you sort of had to push and you had to sort of say, but it's, I, there were choices I remember I made along the way, and one of them was working remotely. Uh, one of them was saying, "Yeah, I'm not going to do that." And, you know, I remember people would be very surprised, and they'd be like, "What do you mean you're not going to do this? Why are you?" There? there used to be that sort of thing. Well, you just do what you're told. I'm like, "I'm not going to do this. I don't want to." You know, and investing in my health early. Obviously, I have a bandage in my cheek right now from the mole I got removed, but yeah, that's about the worst of it. Not a not a health, not really even a health issue, but. Um, you know, I mean, there, that people would be very struggling, I'm like, wait, you can't tell people that. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to. I mean, you know, I mean, you have to be good at your job. Right, but, right. You know, it, it was I've, very surprising. Go ahead. Right. Well, it's it, all of this is making me curious about um, when you left your the the partnership or the the firm 20 years ago, went to Europe, did some traveling, came back. Was that when you came back, did you start your own firm at that point or was it? No, I mean, it's I, actually it was 22 years ago, but it's I'm, I started came back 20 years ago. Uh, no, because I was a new lawyer. I'd only been out like five years. And all I really knew was professional maybe soccer and, you know, what any five year attorney, know, four or five year attorney knows. So what did you do then? I had to take a look. I had to honestly assess. I mean, for those of you who are lawyers, and it's not that people won't be good. It takes years and years and years, and years even to get good in one area. And you kind of, so I had to look at the areas I wanted to do and what kind of work I wanted to do um, and you know, how long it would take to learn it and be good at it. And because uh, you know, a lot of lawyers will see, they go like, oh, I only do this, you know, because it does take a lot of time to learn. And, and law is one of those things that you, you can't just read about it and do it. You get good by doing it, you know, so it's uh, continual and, you know, there are people who want to retain your services and pay you to do that. <laughs> but so- the, what was um, what was the time when you did come back? You made the decisions to to be more intentional about what you were going to do. When was the time where you um, you walked away realizing that you did the right thing, leaving the other job, going to Europe, and then being? Oh, I knew when I left. What- I, did, I knew when I left. I didn't want to go back I, at all. I mean, I didn't. Right. Not, not that I didn't keep in touch with my old boss because he's a great guy. No, I knew right away. Um, but I would say, uh, and to finish answering your question, I mean, you just had to sort of commit and say, these are the areas I want to work on. A couple of others we added, like entertainment law, which, but um, you kind of just had to say, okay, for the next 15 to 20 years, this is what you're doing, learning how to do this. And it's, wow. you know, like in medicine and things like that, doctors say, when they come out of medical school, I'm sure they know some things, but when they go into residency, they learn, you know, it's, it, it, being a good lawyer is kind of a lifelong commitment. If you really, if you want to just show up and want to brief, then that's one thing. But if you want to know what really be good at something and know what you're doing and be actually able to help people and you know, modify, you kind of have to know several areas. Um, I wouldn't say until probably the last four or five years. I mean, it, it just kind of started being more, you know, able to do that. And then, uh, you know, I could always handle those things, but just feeling comfortable with that. And you, of course, you need people to help you. You know, no one does it alone. You, know, you have. I've had very. I've been very fortunate that I've had people who have you know, been willing to offer their insights and advice, and, you know, so I could learn, or, you know, teach me how to do this, or at least point me in the right direction so I could learn. You know, and it's. Um, I, I would say in the last probably last few years, you kind of like okay, good. I'm. I'm you know, I was thinking about that because a friend of mine is like, don't you remember? He's like, I remember when I met you, it was a little over 20 years ago. And I was like, oh yeah, no, I'm glad I did all these things. I really am. I mean, I didn't particularly like it sometimes, I'm sure. And I'm sure there were other things that would have been easier, but for my, my, my personal, you know, everybody has different things that they want from life and what they want to contribute. But I, I'm very glad that I did. Uh, but it's not until recently where I've seen more growth 
uh, I would say, but I wasn't always pushing for growth. Sometimes I was just trying to learn and do my job and, you know, things like that. So it wasn't like it more, it's more these days that I think about that because that's the situation I'm in, but I don't, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, I need to do this work and you know, I have it at the time. I have an employer and you know, I, this is my responsibility to them. And you know, this is what I'm here to do. And okay. And you know, things like that. But some, once in a while, you also, I would reassess, you know, what should I be doing to move in the direction I wanted to. But I remember when I made the change, I'm like, I don't know why I ever thought I'd be able to do this. You know, I, was, <laughs> so I had feelings like that for, for a period of time, but I just, I'm like, okay, I got to believe and go forward. Isn't that funny? I, I think about that a lot with um, one particular past job where I was a compliance officer for a federal grant and I don't even like rules. And I look back at that time, like what possessed me to even apply for that job, <laughs> much less do it, you know, take it and what possessed them to hire me for it. But um, I love that idea of looking back and realizing that it served a purpose. There was a reason you did it. And for one thing, you had to explore it to find out if you could do it. Um, and, and I think too many people make the decision not to do things that they're, they're not sure of just simply because they're not sure of it. They don't realize that there's potential growth, even when it ends up being you know, something that you turn away from later on. So I, I, I hear you. <laughs> sometimes, but I bet when you were a compliance officer, you learned skill sets. I bet, I bet there was something you learned from it that was real, of real value. So sometimes it's not, this isn't where I'm going to wind up. And maybe I meet some nice people. Maybe I make some friends. Maybe I just get a good reputation or I learn a skill set, you know, that's, you know, I remember my eighth grade typing teacher, but I, I don't really even tell me how to type, you know, but I don't, you know, it's sometimes you just, those skill sets that you'll keep that, that are is worth as much as anything else. You know, so it's oh, sometimes- definitely, definitely. I know I took the job because I wanted to grow my skill sets in that area, but it's looking back. I know why I took it, but looking back. I'm like, wow. <laughs> and yeah, yes, I, I learned a lot from it. <laughs> sure. I know. Sometimes I'm sure I'm going, oh, God, maybe I wouldn't have done that. I mean, I'm sure I have a few. I would have. Yeah, I would not have handled it that way. If I had to do over or, yeah, I probably wouldn't have. And I, it, like everybody, everybody has one. Yeah, I've had to do that. I would not have done that. Yeah, that was not something I was going to do. <laughs> but, but you're I, kind but of I, grateful. Right. You're grateful oh, yeah. for the experience regardless. Usually, usually. I mean, it, as lawyers. I mean, we do deal with very, very serious matters. So we, I think more than a lot of people, we deal with, I mean, we deal with life and death. We deal with very dangerous situations. So serious you know, consequences. Yeah, yeah, there are. I think sometimes it's like, okay, well, I probably shouldn't have bought in that car. You know, there's sometimes as a lawyer, there are far more serious consequences, physical, emotional, financial, you know, just it, legally, you know, there. But um, yeah, I think everybody, if they look, they go, yeah, I wouldn't have done, I, I wouldn't have done that again. I mean, I think it's, you know, there, there's some, you know, and part of it depends, I think, how much risk a person's willing to take, you know, where you are with your life. You, know, you might be a little more risk adverse if you have ki- young children uh, or, you know, and a mortgage to pay or people to support, you know, th- there's other things to go. But I, I think, you know, one of the great things, frankly, not to sound too patriotic here about this country is one of the few countries in the world where you have social mobility, you have uh job mobility and things like that there are a lot of people you hear you hear a lot of these people who just came from nothing and they're they're able to you know they could be you know own their own companies and things like that and that's probably what's unique to the u.s most of the u.s as opposed to being born into a situation that you don't really have a lot of choice about interesting so if you could um leave this conversation with a, a lesson a story of something that went really well for you that you think about now as I'm so glad I did that. Um, what is a particular incident that when you think back, maybe it's a client that had a very positive outcome or something that you walked away from feeling really good about? Um, yeah. I remember when I was a couple of them, uh, well, for sports, I remember I had a my friend of mine wanted to recruit me to go professional and I had my last sports and I was kind of tired of dealing with it. Just so I, I was, and my friend, I talked to my friends and they, she said, well, you need, I need to know, you know, she wasn't giving me a deadline, but I, really and I, I was glad I went to tryouts and made the team because I was glad I went and I, you know, then I had to move again, you know, they, so I yeah, transferred to another team, essentially or traded. And I was glad I did because I, I think that if I hadn't, my life would have been very different than it is today. And for cases, um, yeah, I had, 
one case in particular, I knew we were going to lose, but I went anyways and tried it. And um, you know, in telling the client, hey, this is likely not going to go this way. And I think my first jury trial where I really had very little idea what I was doing. And the partner said, I need you to try this. I've got to go do something else. You, you can, you've can, you got the skill sets you're going to have to give you. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go in and try it and work. You know, I probably worked harder than was necessary because I was new and I want, you know, when you're new at anything, you're kind of like, okay, I wanted this, but I remember we won and the verdict came in and I remember the judge said, I really didn't want to rule you know, this way, but there was just so much evidence I had to. And, you know, it was very, you know, we wound up parting ways with the client eventually, but we won. And I, I sometimes I learned a really important life lesson that, you know, as a person and a lawyer, sometimes you have to see things through, particularly it's not, it's not always about money. You know, sometimes you have to just go in and try this and you were giving people access to justice that in the legal systems they may not otherwise have and how important right. lawyers really are to society. And not that any one lawyer is better than the other, but it just as a whole, what this, the, the services or function that lawyers provide is, is really essential and makes a huge difference to people. It really does. That was, that was I would say. Wow. Yeah, having that awakening moment must have been great in terms of just okay, I'm I'm in the right place. I'm having a positive impact, and it's it's where I need yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. I mean, there's always other considerations, but I remember thinking, okay, this is doable. I can, you know, I can be a trial lawyer, and I can do this. And it was because you know, there's always the mystery. You know, it's always kind of a mysterious thing. You know, you hear about mm-hmm. trial lawyers and what these people do. You know, L.A. law and things you see on TV. You watch too much TV. Right. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. My godfather, my dad was a lawyer, and then my uh, my godfather's a lawyer, so I, mean, I was used to being around lawyers with their transactions, so they didn't really do, you know, I'd seen Perry Mason, you know, I, obviously that's not very Love that show. <laughs> no, it is great, but it's probably not always realistic about how you know, like, no, it's, it's a little so, dramatic. <laughs> it is. Actually, I was telling someone the other day, like, what we see in courtrooms and cases is far more dramatic to see in TV and movies. Not all the time. Sometimes it's like, okay, but sometimes they're really... Far more than you'd expect. Yeah. So this has been such a pleasure. I've really enjoyed hearing your stories about the, the transitions that you've made, the impact you have, your thoughts about what attorneys do and how much time it takes to to really be good at one area of law. And it changes. I mean, lots of lots of law changes regularly. So it makes it it's kind of like accounting. You can't just know what you're doing in accounting and be done learning. I know it's it's very similar with law and case law in particular because each case influences further cases. So I really appreciate hearing these stories. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, sure. And I appreciate you writing. And I thank, thank Jeff and Jeff Berman for introducing us. And I, uh, I will add with the pandemic, we have alerts coming out every day. So what is the law today it may not be the law tomorrow, as everyone knows. But I, I hope this was really helpful for you and uh, informative for your listeners. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are you ready to start your story portfolio so you have the right story ready to share when the opportunity presents itself? When you're ready to get started, my book, Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will, is available in all the regular places. And the audiobook version is available on Google Play and on my website, elkinsconsulting.com. As a special bonus for listeners, The audiobook includes two songs recorded by my band, Spare Change, in my living room in Montana. Also on my website is a free podcast interview checklist. It's available to download to make sure you make the most out of your next podcast interview. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to rate the podcast and leave a review. And let me know that you've done it so I can thank you properly. Thank you. Thank you.